Hi, my name is Haru Masood, and I am a fourth year general biology major at UC San Diego. I am also a student for BioClock Studio Winter 2016, and here I am today with Dr. Till Ronenberg. In your book, which is Internal Time, uh, you mentioned the term social jet lag a number of times. Could you explain what you mean by this term? Um, your physiology listens mostly to your body clock, and this body clock is not so much entrained by the clocks on the wall or, or the, the clock on your wrist or, on, or in your phone um, as, as it is now, but it is entrained by light and darkness, whereas your social demands are very much dictated by uh, the um, social clock. And if, they, if these two clocks don't, um, are not synchronized with each other, it's as if your biology lives in one time zone and your work and social life lives in another time zone. And when they don't match, then you have a jet lag situation, which is unlike the travel jet lag, not something you never can get over. Because um, you never, your clocks don't adjust. Um, they adjust to the light and darkness. You, you, you stay where you are. The light and darkness stays where you are and, and, and changes only with season whereas your work times are always in discrepancy to your biological times, and therefore you have constantly a social a, a jet, jet lag situation, which we have coined social jet lag. What are some ways people who travel frequently, like yourself, and work shifts can help fix their sleep schedules? Well, for most shift workers, it's difficult because they have fixed um, uh, work schedules where they can't just get up when they want. I mean, usually the best thing is that you sleep whenever you're sort of tired and you wake up without an alarm clock because that's when your body clock wakes you up. For example, at the moment, um, I wake up here at 4 o'clock in the morning, which is very late for my body clock um, because um, I'm five hours out of um, the country where I've come from. Um, so I'm waking up quite late according to my body clock, but I'm waking up very early according to the social clock. Uh, if you want to adjust to shift work, rotating shift work, um, I would advise you not to do that because it means that you are changing your clock every time you go into a new shift. If you have a permanent shift, it would be good if you adjust it, but if you're rotating through morning, evening, and night shift, I don't think it is good that you adjust, but what, we've done something which is um, quite helpful. And we've taken the workforce of a company and we have, um, by questionnaires, determined where, they, where their body clock is, whether they're early types, intermediate types, or late types. And according to that um, measurement, we have redistributed them in the given work schedule. So early types didn't have to do so many night shifts anymore, and late types didn't have to do so many early shifts anymore, but there was still the, always the same workforce as before the experiment started. The, every shift had, had their, their normal number of people. And by redistributing the people, we have um, made it possible that they sleep over an hour more um, during the work week and then they did under the uh, traditional scheme, which shows that taking individuality into account can be a great measure of reducing the stress that is caused by, by, jet, uh, by, by um, rotating shift work. How do you cope with and what's your remedy for jet lag when you travel internationally? I just try to sleep when I'm tired. But sometimes when I travel around the world the wrong way, and that is towards the east, because I have to advance, I do a little trick. And that is I split my sleep into two four-hour bouts, or the, the windows in which I want to sleep. And I, I keep one of the four-hour bouts um, always in, in the night that um, corresponds to my hometown, Munich. And the other four hours I do flexible 
of, um, uh, whenever I can in the different countries and time zones. And that helps a lot. So you, you can only do it if you have a very free schedule, uh, free timetable, so that you can say, I don't want to meet you now because I would like to do my nap. Yeah? But it's something that um, really helps you get through um, the stress of, of having a jet lag body. You, you have an anchor sleep, what I call anchor sleep, at the time where you normally sleep at home. And it also makes you um, makes adjustment back home easier because you can, then can sort of fuse the two four hour bouts into one again. And one of them has stayed exactly where you normally sleep at home. Having all of this circadian rhythm research, do you apply it to your personal life and especially to your family members? Well, my family members are too old and out of the house and therefore I can't apply it to them anymore. And I never could apply it properly because school starts very early. And if it was um, um, according to my insights, um, I would have not sent my children to school as early as I had to, but I didn't have any other choice. So for years, we got up much too early, um, and my children too. But uh, now that I uh, don't have to send children back to school anymore, uh, I can. I try to always live without an alarm clock and sleep when I fall asleep and wake up when I wake up. And um, ever since I do that, I am hardly ever tired during the day. What is the part of your work that brings you the most satisfaction? Well, um, I used to be a circadian biologist who worked mostly in the lab, uh, asking questions about how things work in, in the body and in the cell. And I have transitioned to asking questions how the clock works in real life. And I find it exceedingly satisfactory to f f uh, find, um, on one hand, that many of the theoretical thoughts we produced in the lab actually hold up, and they are true even in, in the dirty real world. And at the same time, um, to look at the clock and also at sleep in the context of, the, of real life, whether it's shift workers or high school kids who, who have to go to school much too early, um, whether it's uh, patients uh, who, who could be supported by more light and darkness. Um, it's very nice to, to actually find out much more and at the same time directly help people. And that combination is what I find most satisfactory. What are your future plans and how do you plan on progressing in further research? circadian rhythms? Well, actually, I'm moving more and more away from circadian rhythms, and I'm using what we have established, and that is um, probing questions concerning human biology and behavior um, with a large amount of, of subjects, be it by questionnaire or be it by measuring actimetry. Um, we can find out a lot about how the circadian clock works in real life, and also I want to know more about how sleep functions in real life. And that's where I'm going. I'm using actimetry to um, measure sleep, not in the sleep lab, but in the context of real life in many, many, many thousands of people. And I'm hoping to answer a couple of questions which I think are very important and which we don't have a definite answer to yet. And that is, can I devise a, an objective measurement for sleep quality so that if I do an intervention like um, put in different lighting into a building or a school or tell people to sleep in a different way so that I can then measure whether I actually have achieved something. As long as we don't have an objective measurement for sleep quality, um, we can't actually know how good our interventions were, what the results of them were. And that's one question. So we'll find a way of objectively measuring sleep quality. The other is I would like to know how much sleep different individuals really need. I know already that the need is very individual. Some people can get away with three or four hours and others need eight or nine. But we don't really, since we don't have as yet an objective measurement for sleep quality, we don't really need, know how much sleep we need. And there's a big debate about sleep need. And it is um, colored by the fact that many people who um, lead this debate, 
think of sleep as being something that is taking time away from being awake and therefore it's a nuisance. And um, my goal is to persuade people to embrace sleep as something that makes a high quality wake time possible and is never taking away um, from, from being awake. It makes you awake.